Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us today at the third and final webinar brought to you by the EDUPAL Erasmus Plus project team. My name is Cathy Payne. I'm a program manager for All Ireland Institute of Hospice and Palliative Care, which is one of the EDUPAL partner organisations. EDUPAL is an Erasmus Plus funded project aimed at producing a comprehensive palliative care training programme for undergraduate medical students and is led by Associate Professor Dr. Daniela Mosai from Romania with partner organisations across Romania, Belgium, Germany, Ireland, Austria and Spain. If you haven't already done so, I would really encourage you to visit the project website edupal.eu where you will see lots of useful information about our project and a wealth of free resources to support your palliative care teaching and learning. If you missed the first two webinars from this week, which focused on curriculum building and mentoring in undergraduate palliative care education and novel teaching methods for palliative care education, Recordings of these will also be available shortly from that EDUPAL website. So again, another great reason for going on and having a look at our site. As an attendee, your microphone and camera are automatically switched off. If you would like to ask questions during the session, please type these in the Q&A box, which is at the bottom of your Zoom screen. We would also kindly ask you to complete a very short and anonymous feedback form on SurveyMonkey at the end of this webinar, which you will be directed to when the webinar finishes. Today's webinar, which will last for approximately 60 minutes, focuses on the challenging topic of performance assessment in palliative care education. And it is my delight to introduce you to the first of our two speakers this afternoon. Dr. Pradet Pal works at the Paracelis Medical University in Salzburg, Austria. She is the coordinator of the World Health Organization Collaborating Center and a researcher and academic in the Institute for Nursing Science and Practice. The main focus of her work is to promote and advance palliative care education in the World Health Organization Euro region. She is an active member of the European Association for Palliative Care Spiritual Care Reference Group and for the past three years has been an associate partner in the EDUPAL project. Her presentation topic this afternoon is how to measure performance in education. So I will hand over to Perez. Thank you, Katie, very much, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I am really glad to greet you all in this um, final EDUPAL experience online seminar. It seems that um, dealing with the most neglected areas in palliative care uh, has become my personal destiny. Besides spiritual care, a uh, performance assessment in palliative care education is um, something that is calling for much more attention. And um, if my uh, presentation starts, then I will invite you today to a journey without a particular destination. Now we could go to the next slide already. <laughs> Thank you. Um, however, I hope this journey uh, will uh, create um, some little moments worth of remembering and perhaps even implementing in your personal practice as an educator or palliative care clinician. After all, our common goal is to support our students uh, to become not only better physicians and nurses, but also mature individuals. Uh, who are not only familiar with palliative care philosophy, but who are capable of acknowledging the death as their personal destiny, just plainly because people who are aware of death and dying evidently live much happier lives. Next slide, please. So the past two EDUPAL online lectures have indicated that uh, developing communication skills 
is one of the most important tasks um, of palliative care education. Unfortunately, there is not much to report in terms of effectiveness of such trainings. Recent systematic review conducted by Brighton and colleagues reported on poor study quality, poor evaluation and assessment quality. Next slide, please. In 2015, I um, and uh, with some, uh, some colleagues um, from Germany published a systematic review on effects of spiritual care training. The results were equally uh, moderate. The assessment strategies were poorly selected, course evaluation and performance assessment were um, frequently mixed up. It was not clear whose experiences were reported and the articles were all very optimistic about students' knowledge gain, even if the teaching goals were not defined. Next slide. Uh, you may think that uh, it was back then and now everyone knows better. Uh, let me demonstrate the, the opposite. We are currently redoing the same systematic review on spiritual care training. And unfortunately, at this point, I cannot report on any immense improvements regarding the meaningfulness of performance assessments conducted, at least when it comes to published articles. Furthermore, um, a survey, a survey I conducted in 2019 among palliative care educators and clinicians resulted in following findings. All participants agreed that uh, performance assessment is a very difficult subject and therefore before deciding on any assessment strategies, it should first be established where the learners are in their learning curve. Um, this statement makes evident the, the, evident, uh, the importance of fine-tuned performance assessments throughout the learning experience. In fact, I would like to argue that it is not uh, important where the students find themselves at the um, end of the course. Their journey as a medical professional is just beginning at this point, but we need to make their learning process memorable, maybe even difficult, uh, so that uh, they will remember what palliative care is about and what options are out there. So let me present you with some assessment strategies um, that could be used in the beginning, in between and at the very end. Uh, first of all, uh, baseline assessment. What is that about? Uh, it's about what are students' needs, what are their abilities, what is their potential, for example, thinking about using online and artificial in intelligence solutions. Um, is the technology I plan to use accessible and available to all? Will some students have disadvantages um, as they do not have access to the programs or gadgets? Um, then again, as, a palliative, as palliative care is a difficult topic, I would like to know how are my students doing um, today overall? Um, and of course, the knowledge check, student feedback and experiences can be very valuable for teachers. Of course, when we are open enough to learn from these experiences. So for me personally, um, students' well-being is very, very important issue. We know that many medical and nursing students today struggle with mental health issues and multiple other problems. Therefore, I have been uh, asking my students about their positive and negative life experiences uh, during the past three years. Responses from more than 300 undergraduates indicate that 39% um, have experienced some significant life experiences during past three years. 30% of them report positive life experiences such as birth of siblings or relatives. Um, new relationships, friendships, education, travel or job related matters, um, also moving to a new place. But another 30% report negative life events such as a severe illness of a loved one or a divorce uh, of parents, for example, um, or loss by death. So now imagine discussing loss, death, anticipatory grief with the latter 30. Are you prepared for that? 
Um, of course, a performance assessment does not uh, have to be boring or even very serious uh, before kicking off teaching interdisciplinary teamwork. You might uh, want to check um, some common misconceptions uh, among your students. Um, by the way, the poll you see here uh, is of course imaginary, based on imaginary data. I created it uh, to give you the general idea. When half of your students um, think that nurses bite and other half is not quite sure, uh, this is an important feedback to you as a teacher. You can use this information to explain what nurses do, except from biting, and what their role is. Uh, this will encourage your students to introduce themselves to nurses when they begin to work uh, the wards and it most definitely will flatten the hierarchies that are still very much present in some settings. So let's go further. Now we are in between. What about assessments in between? How can these be made uh, meaningful and memorable? Critical self-reflection is about uh, giving feedback and getting feedback. Students can be reflecting on clinical or classroom learning experiences, you can use psychometric tests to increase student awareness of self. Writing is equally useful because there are many topics we feel uh, uncomfortable um, to discuss with others. Writing is, is exactly um, for this purpose, to express things we cannot talk about. So let's write. Um, remember, these sometimes very personal reflections are to monitor students' growth and maturity only. So keep those well guarded. Let's go further. Um, yesterday we discussed case-based and problem-based learning. Um, so here you can use uh, movies, documentaries, books, articles from the newspapers, art, poems, music, anything you think your students can relate to. And ask your students to analyze and make decisions, having the possible outcomes in mind. Uh, for self-based learning, you can create computerized learning paths that uh, Daniela demonstrated on Tuesday. So you can find this information on EduPal webpage as well. Um, so something um, that has not been discussed yet, but I personally find very important is the care planning and documentation. What to write, how to write, and who is going to read it. What is their perception of what I wrote, how they understand it and interpret it? Um, what about confidentiality? What about legal consequences? So um, maybe give your students the, assign, uh, the assignment to consider. The term consider literally means to study the stars <laughs> in navigation. Um, uh, uh, and in palliative care context, it means to study something together in order to find a direction in a complex situation of shared responsibility. Let's go further, thank you. Using multiple choice tests, um, oral examination, written examination, and at the end of um, any uh, course are probably uh, all familiar to you. OSCEs, simulation labs, panic rooms are gaining more ground as final performance assessment strategies. However, the question how to give personalized feedback, in particular when we speak about hundreds of students attending our courses simultaneously, do you really have the capacity to read 500 self-reflection journals? Faculty's time management should be also considered when planning performance assessments. And in some cases, having students reviewing, giving feedback and grading their fellow students could be a more be beneficial solution. So um, are there any other options for personalized feedback? The EduPal experience suggests that the learning goal-based self-assessment may be a valuable solution to improve performance and motivation. Here I have to tell you a little story. Approximately 10 years ago, I gave an eight minute oral presentation at one of the EAPC Congresses. It was my first EAPC Congress. It was held in Lisbon. 
The topic was uh, student uh, self-assessment and palliative care education. A very evil man, today a dear colleague of mine, Professor Frank Elsner, asked me after my presentation a crucial, basically a career-defining uh, question. What is the point of such self-assessment? Probably he had struggled with this question himself, but indeed, even 10 years later, I often ask myself, uh, what to think about the outcomes based on student self-assessments? The most important question regarding the outcomes concerns the self-perceived ri rise in competences. So are these also applicable in practice or is there a gap? Are students too confident um, in their self-perception? Do they underestimate themselves? Um, normally, you know, the calculation indicates the group mean values, those, uh, the individual performance gain may differ a great deal. For EduPal, um, let, uh, we uh, chose um, um, a comparative retrospective self-assessment model that is based on the learning goals of EduPal curriculum. Perhaps the most important components here are the user friendliness and the self-reflection and the personal feedback options. Um, so how does this um, assessment work? Um, the questionnaire is, is administered once at the end of the course. Um, maybe you move to the next slide, please. Yes, so you can see it as well. Um, participants are invited to reflect on their abilities after and, and before the training. The students rate their skills on a six-point Likert scale. So if you look at it, then they have this kind of statement that I can explain the total pain concept in detail. And then they think that, okay, now I can do, but before the course, my knowledge was here and, uh, and, and so on. Um, we have generated these statements based on learning codes so that um, those should be achieved actually by the end of the course. Um, surely uh, here are also lots of problems, but uh, I will just point out a few. One needs to be aware that retrospective approach might threaten the validity of results to do response shift or um, effort justification bias. And when analyzing the data, the large um, net increase in self-assessment from five to three would produce the same gain as the much smaller increase from two to 1.5. Um, and basically no performance assessment is perfect, but this was the suggestion we came up for EduPal. And um, to summarize, to design a curriculum is a huge effort. Therefore, I would suggest make designing a proper performance assessment from the very beginning part of your journey and not some kind of last minute, oh yes, we need some performance assessment as well action. The worst case scenario is in, as a teacher, personally for me, when you get something like 60 PowerPoint slides, 90 minutes and 150 medical students handed over to you without any explanation and faculty training, this the entire lecture is about making sense of what you're supposed to say maybe you're familiar with this kind of situations i hope not um, not to waste your own and your students time and the precious moments that are allocated to teaching palliative care own your lecture make it memorable make a journey out of it if you are unsure what to do and i uh, how uh, make a detailed menu uh, think of how much time you have how many students you have what methods you can use, what kind of baseline in between and uh, final assessments you can and want to use. Also, how much time and resources you have for this. Make a list of um, resources you need for teaching. Um, be prepared for all sorts of errors. Um, have a quality, uh, have always a plan B, because uh, I have listed some options we can use. Um, and which make teaching much more interactive and interesting and, um, and help us as teachers, but sometimes they just don't work. So have always something on paper ready to give to students. Um, and um, maybe most importantly, respect your students. Uh, so they, based on your example, your leadership, 
um, learn to respect pati uh, patients and their relatives respectively. And um, now next slide, my final slide. The journey is the destination. That is my main motto. So um, let's make the journey memorable. EduPal journey has been very memorable. So I thank all my colleagues uh, for this uh, wonderful time and I hope we continue working together. And uh, also to all listeners, thank you very much for joining and listening. Thank you. Thank you, Perret, um, for a very informative and comprehensive presentation. Oh, I'll just switch my, my camera back on. Uh, if anybody has any particular questions that they would like to ask Perret, if you can please ask those in the Q&A box, that would be super. Perret, just to, to start off the discussion, um, I wonder if you, so measuring performance in education is obviously very important, and what your thoughts are in dealing with and capturing that negative feedback maybe that students have how, how important you think, do you think it is that we address that and how we address it? Yeah, there is a moral and ethical dilemma for us as a faculty always, because we have to kind of show our colleagues that our courses are well perceived. But on the other hand, um, and my experience really is that um, the negative feedback, um, you know, if your student honestly writes that you cannot learn palliative care like this. so. I, I would consider it how, how I can make it more meaningful, and I have been. Um, so um, do not deny negative um, feedback, learn from it. It, uh, it, it really usually comes from, uh, from the bottom of the hearts of the students. Uh, so, um, and if it's constructive criticism, uh, also when you publish something, others can learn from your uh, mistakes. So. Um, like in research, the negative results could be very important not to do the same mistakes again. The same applies to the learning. So not all courses go very well. Um, and there are still many people we can, never can please, of course. But if, if it's something really that you can work on, you can improve, then um, yeah, put it out there and, and work on it. So that's why I think, yeah. Mm -hmm appreciate negative feedback <laughs> yeah i think it's it takes a, a maturity in terms of your your experience as well to be prepared to uh, to share that negative and, and own it doesn't it as well so yeah because that's as you say it's it's much easier to to share the positives and um, but sometimes the, the more learning comes from dealing with the with the difficult situations and um, you just had a, a comment um, there from Dr. Das. I, I know he's joined all three of these sessions, so I've, I'm, I'm delighted that he's um, joined all of them and hopefully has gained a lot. And um, he was saying just, uh, Barrett, he really appreciates and likes your slide on knowledge assessment by creating um, sort of dummy shell tables for quality improve, improvement in palliative, in palliative care. So he's just commenting um, and um, commending your great work. Thank you very much. So if, if other people have any questions that they would like to pose, please do feel free to add those in the Q&A box. But perhaps at this point, I will move on to our second presenter. Um, so again, it is my absolute delight to present uh, another colleague of the EDUPAL project, Dr. Vladimir Boric, and apologies if that's pronounced badly, Vlad, um, is a certified physician practicing palliative care and the head of the palliative care department at the Regional Institute of Oncology in Yash. He is teaching palliative care as an associate professor at the Faculty of Medicine, Rigora T. Popa University of Medicine and Pharmacy in Yash. Vlad is the vice president of the National Romanian Association of Palliative Care and is involved in many research, educational and advocacy projects in the field of palliative care. His presentation today discusses students' feedback and perception regarding their experience when completing a palliative care module. So over to you, Vlad. Hello, everybody. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you, Katie. Thank you, Daniela, for organizing this wonderful project, Yudupal, and uh, for creating this uh, really 
uh, team and framework to express our um, uh, thoughts, our uh, research. I will present um, some experience of our um, uh, implementing palliative care curricula in uh, our university. I will start the screen share. Is it okay, Katie? Yes, yes, that's great. Okay, so it's about students' feedback and perception regarding their experience during completing palliative care module. First of all, I want to introduce you in the topic in Romania, as you can see, st starting from uh, about three years, the Romanian Agency for Quality Assurance in Higher Education stated that palliative care uh, will be compulsory for bachelor's degree in medical and nursing faculties throughout the uh, entire country. So in um, our, um, all our faculties of medicine in Romania. It's in Romania, but I will pass uh, quickly. In, as you can see in Grigiri Palliative, uh, that means uh, palliative care is for medical students and here is for uh, nursing students. <coughs> Our uh, university, Grigore Tepopa uh, from Iași, have already, has already implemented uh, palliative care as discipline. It was for the, I think for the first time in Romania, there are almost seven years, uh, we have implemented this uh, um, uh, palliative care uh, uh, discipline as a mandatory discipline. And uh, of course, Faculty of Medicine of uh, Transylvania University of Brasov already implemented, but uh, they have implemented for the first time in Romania a, a, a program of postgraduate palliative care uh, master degree uh, at their university, as you can see. So, for those who maybe <laughs> don't know where is Iași in Romania, is a very big city in the northeast of the country, a very uh, nice city. We have our university that is um, a traditional one. Uh, among the first faculties of medicine in Romania, from 1879, it, it was the Faculty of Medicine here. I put uh, an example of our syllabus of palliative care. As you can see, we have only four hours of lectures and 14 hours of clinical uh, stages. That means practical activities. And that is not so much, but we, we try to deal with this uh, a small amount of hours allocated to our uh, discipline. Maybe you are wondering where we um, uh, we manage at our discipline such a big number of students. As you can see, our university has almost nine thousand of students. Only the Faculty of Medicine five. And in the third year of medicine uh, faculty, there are almost 1,000 of students, and all of these students have to pass the palliative care discipline. So there is a huge number of students, and we have, of course, classrooms for uh, certain types of activities, but we have to uh, representative uh, medical institutions in the, in the area, Regional Institute of Oncology and the uh, Sokola uh, Institute of Psychiatry, where uh, our students have uh, the practical activities, the practical stages. So, usually we are using a questionnaire to evaluate uh, our teaching methods, so with um, uh, teaching assessment questionnaire um, applied by our students. Of course, after the students uh, complete our uh, discipline and they got the mark, so everything is fine, can change, cannot change anything, so we um, 
uh, we are uh, very precautious to to have the real the real results as possible. So the questionnaire is more uh, complex. I have selected for this presentation uh, for this presentation only some of the our results. Of course, the consent is uh, obtained. So, dear students, as uh, I have already said, so the first uh, topic we have evaluated was the informational content of the lectures. As you can see, the uh, majority of the students considered uh, a good informational content, excellent, very good, good. So, this was um, uh, every year we uh, struggle to adapt our content and uh, uh, so that the, our students will be very content. The informational content of the seminar, as you can see, the, uh, the answers of our students was uh, very positive, excellent, very good and good. The, our training methods or uh, also uh, positively appreciated by, by our students. Uh, we you have used uh, different teaching methods like classic lectures, of course, like uh, uh, clinical uh, uh, stages uh, uh, in hospital, but also case presentations, role plays, uh, debates, problem-based learning, um, sometimes case simulations, interactive teaching, of course. Usefulness of the lecture material. As you can see, it was very positive appreciated also. The learning climate, atmosphere, also uh, appreciated positive by the vast majority of the students. And the also, the usefulness of information during seminars, as you can see, excellent, very good and good. So, the, there was a very positive appreciation. The presentation of representative case, cases during our practical activities was uh, also appreciated by our students. As you can see, excellent, very good and good. And the last two, uh, questions, uh, the students were asked to give a global appreciation of palliative uh, care discipline by giving a mark from 1 to 10. So you can see 28% uh, gave us 10, 21, 9, 21 also 8 marks. So almost 70 of the responders gave us a good mark, we consider. And uh, the last, the attractiveness of the palliative care discipline, also to give marks from one to 10. You can see also uh, uh, interesting answers. The majority of answers also were, uh, their mark were from eight to 10, so was also positive appreciation of uh, the attractiveness of our discipline. Then I have selected some um, material from uh, our students' essays because uh, it was not an evaluation, it was like a, a qualitative research, but it's, I cannot say that is a real qualitative research because it's a uh, um, ongoing this research we uh, came uh, to present to you a, a few um, intermediary um, results so we will complete this research in, a, in the next month there were almost 500 uh, papers from our students describing their experience uh, their thoughts uh, um, after completing our palliative care discipline. And we grouped this um, um, 
uh, their thoughts, their uh, opinions into some uh, uh, topics. For example, this one, the first topic called it showed the first of all, we should appreciate the life and second, we thought how to manage with our patients in terminal phase. And I have highlighted some of the most um, representative quotations of our students. For example, one of the students said, we are studying about human body and how it works, but we are not studying about that. We are not studying about mortality. We are not thinking of this. Not even when we are seeing the corpse at anatomy, even in that moment, we are thinking that we are doing that just for saving, just for giving to our future patients a better life, or better said, to give him back the health and well-being. Starting to study palliative care should be another phase of medicine, very important thought. It teaches us how appreciative we have to be of life alive by implementing in us the courage to accept that our days are numbered. Second topic, it showed what holistic approach means. For example, it taught me what a holistic approach was and how important it is in treating a person as a whole, not only the physical problems or different personal resonance between the concept of palliative care and what it associates, pain, death, treatment, regimen, quality of life. To improve the quality of life, some of our students uh, have written real stories. For example, I selected, so he chose palliative care. It was a, a personal experience. In order to have a better quality of life, his counseling, support, and in order to spend less time in a hospital, also to fight depression because pain can be a depressing fact of life for many people with serious illnesses and so on. Last but not the least, I realized that palliative care doesn't necessarily mean the end of someone's life, but the environment of making someone feel great inside his new world. Of course, communication was a very common topic. In order to alleviate some of patients' distress, it is crucial to be empathetic in the sense of understanding how a patient is feeling and the reactions they are having. We have to focus more on verbal and non-verbal communication, choose the questions carefully and have a discussion that does not cause discomfort. Brought a touch of joy and confidence to patients hurt about uh, touching the shoulder. Communication play, plays a crucial role in personal devel development as doctors as well as people. Spike's protocol also about dying, death, and bereavement. There are there were some uh, thoughts of our students. I respect both choices, but if the chance of success would be very low, I prefer to have happy time before dying. Helps to be a good doctor. This is very important for us. This is a real we consider a real appreciation of our palliative care. Uh, discipline and we consider that we got our meaning, our purpose of one of the major purposes of our palliative care discipline. Let's see, it was on of one of my best classes in the faculty for being interested in this class because it really gave us the benefits about how to be a good doctor then can understand the patients in the right way. I truly become much more sensitive regarding this topic, topic and also regarding how we as doctors should understand the patient's needs. What I have learned from this discipline is humanity, more and more clinical, how to deal with pain. And even if we can't add days to life, we can put more life into patients. Or I will never be able to work in a palliative care department because I need mental strength and a strong psychological status. Indeed, every doctor needs to know how to take patients spiritual, emotional, physical, 
and psychological well-being into account when making decisions. And doctors in any specialty could be asked to have a difficult conversation or give bad news. That's why this is not a job for everyone about palliative, to be a palliative care doctor. And also correct medications for pain. I will not insist about morphine needs, uh, analgesic treatment according uh, who analgesic ladder, emotional impact. Sometimes I was impressed to tears and this was my favorite part. You'll need a lot of napkins for internships. We had a certain number, not so many, but a certain number of students crying after uh, seeing our patients and after discussing with patients. My favorite subject this year, noted another student. Nothing can prepare you for what you will see in the palliative care world. I came out of that internship a little emotionally shaken. Introspection. Happiness is hard to find. You are not satisfied with yourself. Are you afraid of death? My heart stopped. And you know why? Not because I'm scared, but because I just thought about, with, about it without debating it or saying it out loud. I was among those who replied, that no, I'm not afraid, and realized that I never thought for a second about my death. We are not here for a long time. We are here for a good time. Imagine all these thoughts was written by our third year medical student of our faculty. And finally, personal development. The course and internships made me, make, made me stronger, understanding the complexity of this service. I noticed that the close in relationship with the divinity offered him peace, well-being, and optimism, which he showed, which I personally consider paramount. Changing the perception of a medical act itself, a short history, it turned out to be a true story. It changed, first of all, my conception of medical practice. At times, I looked at tears, wrinkles of suffering, shaky voices, patients collapsed by the cruel diagnosis. Other times I looked at the most exuberant and communicative patients, both cases showing or hiding unimaginable suffering. And finally, I put here some opinions of our teachers, of my colleagues, which uh, were uh, having classes with our students and uh, were beautiful words. For example, try to help students through teaching activities in palliative care internships, covering the entire subject included in the curriculum, but emphasizing the holistic approach, impeccable treatment of pain and other symptoms, awareness of it, the importance of the way of communicating with the patient and acquisitions of communication algorithms, algorithms. As a teacher, I believe that I can instill a concept, a mentality that will lead to an evolution in the future medical activity of students. I love to provoke emotions, to make students connect to their patients' realities, to make them aware and to integrate them in the complex mechanism of the medical act. that were thought about practical skills that can be acquired only by observing and subsequently applying them, an activity that needs to be closely guided to the teacher. Or some experience of one of my colleagues, before introducing palliative care at the, as a discipline at the curriculum of the Faculty of Medicine, I believe that the doctor leaving the doors of the faculty did not receive any approved training in terms of communication with the patient or notions that help guide optimal symptomatic treatment. treatment. Consequently, every doctor had to empirically approach this aspect of communication, the whole process being deeply affected by his personality and intuition, or try to make the students aware of the medical act. 
of course, we have a large number of students and we uh, are experiencing the lack of spaces sometime for um, our uh, practical internships, especially. Um, online teaching during the pandemic had advantages and also disadvantages. Some of my colleagues consider it an additional barrier in the student's knowledge and acquisition of the holistic approach, or a, could be an advantage of disseminating notions on a very large scale, but without being able to obtain effective feedback from our students. And I, or we, my colleagues, uh, we are thinking that the first purpose, our purpose of teaching palliative care to third year students was to make them understand what palliative care means and what are the principles behind palliative care. So the holistic approach. And we consider that we have achieved this goal. And uh, this online education that we had to implement during the pandemic was a real change, challenge for us because we had to adapt some of our teaching methods to be only online. And of course, having practical work in this discipline for, I, I suppose, and I mean, uh, uh, same um, opinion, I, I suppose, with all of my colleagues, is a real satisfaction. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Vlad. Um, so again, if I can ask if anybody has any questions, if they want to type those into the Q&A box. Um, Vlad, I was just wondering what you feel have been your biggest challenges within your university in teaching palliative care and in evaluating the impact of that teaching. I think especially given that it's got such a tiny amount of time on your curriculum, obviously that, that's uh, quite a challenge for you. Uh, first of all, it was a real challenge to introduce uh, me and uh, some of my colleagues because uh, during the time we became much more uh, teachers. Uh, it was a really uh, challenge to introduce, to convince the president of, of the university and it was a very open-minded professor uh, to accept introducing because everybody knows uh, every time there is no space for other discipline, all other discipline are the most important, everyone's discipline is the mo most important, so it was a real ch challenge to introduce. It was also a, a real challenge to introduce at third year students because it's the first time in the third year when students uh, enter in the contact with the clinical setting, so um, some of my colleagues considered that it was uh, too early, maybe, for the students' experience. But uh, now I can say that it's a very proper uh, moment in um, uh, their, during their uh, faculty in the third year, because we have the chance to model the students, to offer them this holistic perspective as the beginning of their clinical involvement. So I consider this uh, a real, a real uh, uh, opportunity. And which, uh, how did you decide which parts of the EDUPAL curriculum that you were going to adopt in your university, you know, given that it, it didn't have a huge amount of, of time allocated within the, the whole medical course? Yes, indeed, we have only two courses, so that means four hours of lectures and 14 hours of clinical activities. That means seven clinical stages of two hours each. So 
we uh, I recognize uh, I uh, asked advice from Daniela and we picked up from the main topics we considered the most important to be put in our lectures and in our practical activities and the other that were exceeded uh, the possibility to to teach uh, in a classical manner or to to be done by uh, self uh, study by our students we gave them the all the materials and they had to study themselves and do you feel that they engaged with all of those materials but I suppose maybe the most part of them, mm -hmm. yes. Um, a question just came in about the assessment of the students. Um, I'm just wondering whether there was an opportunity, you know, when they were dis dis you know, using that questionnaire, you know, they were very closed ended questions and was there a possibility for a no response or maybe for a comment on those so where you were saying you know, very good excellent was there a not sure option or a option to put a comment on from the student no um uh, the, it was no mandatory question so if uh, one student uh, didn't want to answer they they could skip the, 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 the question. Okay, thank you. Um, just to remind everybody that um, there will be a short anonymous que questionnaire at the end of this on um, using SurveyMonkey and we would really encourage you please to um, complete that at the end of this webinar. Um, a question there that's just come in, is there a plan for you to follow the students into clinical practice to evaluate the impact of the training that's been received? And yes. I guess that's maybe a question for both of you, but for Vlad initially. Of course. Uh, we have already discussed with Daniela and she has a, a objective a structured uh, assessment questionnaire for uh, the students so we will use it from the next university year I mean beginning from October this year with the next class of our students thank you and Pirat your training is there any evaluation of the impact of of any of the training in palliative care in terms of its impact on clinical practice mm -hmm. No, but uh, in the framework of the Poly Edupal project, um, there is um, a plan to um, uh, to look at Romania and the impact of, of these palliative care courses and maybe um, first in 10 years. So I'm really, really interested because uh, many universities simultaneously launched their palliative care program. And so we could um, really uh, look in the future um, uh, assess the clinicians and, and see uh, if they have benefited from this program. I don't think that the change will happen in one year or something like that. So we all know about hidden curriculum, old practices are tough to break and so on. So um, yeah, so I, I, I still continue with my journey metaphor here and I think that it will be a long journey, but I hope that it will be a very um, successful story for Romania and um, yes so we will see but we have to wait a little bit I suppose <laughs> and I think that this is a very interesting comment as well and very relevant so um, someone who's mentioning that within their palliative care nursing curriculum that there's seven hours theory 14 hours practicum placement no uh, um, for our I didn't mention because I the, the, the study was done only to medical faculty yeah. students. But I think it's relevant nursing, again, just in terms of, of how, because it's a similar amount really, isn't it? There's no, with nursing uh, uh, faculty, we had much more hours. We have 14 hours of lectures and 28 hours of practical activities. So much more hours for nursing students. Yeah, but would you feel though even for the medical students that that's sufficient to really embed the basics of palliative care or in an ideal world would you be looking for a bit more of the curriculum 
a bit more time. Mm. <laughs> I think Can I, could I, could I make a short comment on this? <laughs> yes. Because I think that it is um, something um, uh, to consider also for teachers and classroom uh, room learning that uh, if we put like this kind of frontal teaching um, the knowledge uh, with knowledge assessment and progress online and students can use it for the safe based learning then the teaching in the classroom will change and if you know that in many universities we struggle with this practical placements and the hospitals and it's difficult to find people who will uh, be who are ready to mentor and do the leadership. And now, because of the COVID, even more difficult. So, um, lots of bedside learning must move to simulation uh, rooms um, and also to the classrooms. And um, and I think that that's uh, again maybe for a new project uh, funded by Erasmus Plus to see what kind of options we uh, we have to bring the bedside into classroom. There are already some wonderful ex ex examples, but um, but I think that um, there is more out there. So, and we have to uh, work on this um, in a more structured way, but also uh, together. Not because um, if you do it alone by yourself, it's just wasted. You know, others have to know and learn from it as well. So, I think that's the power of Educal Project as well, isn't it? I wonder if Daniela would maybe like to make a, a last few comments as this is the, the last of the three webinars, not to put you on the spot, Daniela, but um, Daniela is the lead of our Edupal project and has been the driving force of, of all of the, the project for us. And I just wonder if you might like to say a few words. Oh, thank you, Katie. Uh, thank you for, uh, for uh, sharing so uh, the seminar and thank you Vlad and uh, pa, uh, Piret and all our other colleagues who have uh, done the webinars. I think uh, they have uh, very well represented the work that we have done for EDUPAL. What I want to say is that basically the last output in our project, which is uh, teaching methods and performance assessment, is in the finalizing phase and it will also be available on the EDUPAL website um, the, probably till end of September. We will have it up there. Um, I, uh, I would like to answer to the question, I tried to do a 72 hour curriculum and I felt it wasn't enough because you were asking, Katie, was it enough? <laughs> I did uh, even extra courses. <laughs> so I think we are too ambitious in a way. And I think we really have to become clever in combining horizontal with vertical integration. <laughs> so we have the block module, but I think we need also other things because if palliative care assumes everything, symptom management, uh, uh, communication, ethics, uh, uh, terminal care, uh, I don't know, bereavement, counseling, uh, empathy, everything. I think it's, it's not enough in the, in the curriculum, but, uh, but I think it, it's a start. And I think also what you said, Piret, about collaboration is wonderful. I think with, with these webinars, it was for us to say about EDUPAL, but also we learn from, uh, from colleagues, from other colleagues, what, what they are doing. And I think also something that was interesting is about interdisciplinarity. We focused at Dupal on medical students, but I think also we need to learn how can we learn together because palliative care is about teamwork. So I think this is something which we haven't tested with our Edupal project, but it was interesting in some uh, presenters comment yesterday uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Jose Pereira from, um, uh, from Canada, he was talking how they are teaching their students together. And I think we have to learn these things. And um, so I hope the APC will, will go further with, uh, with um, trying to build on what, what we learned and what we, uh, we uh, had the opportunity to share. So thank you very much for all the colleagues who have been involved in this enterprise. Thank you, Daniela. Thank you, Perez. Thank you, Vlad. Thank you, of course, to Uana, who has been in the background um, organizing all of us and organizing these webinars of actually the project. So we couldn't we couldn't do this without her. 
And to all of you who have joined us today, thank you so much. Please, please do check out the EDUPAL website and um, use the information that we have lots of lovely free resources for you. Uh, and please don't forget to complete our evaluation. As we said, evaluation is so important to us. All of it, good and bad, we learn from. So please do take a moment to share your thoughts with us. Thank you very much. And hopefully we will be in contact with you again. Take care. Bye bye.